Hello, and thank you for joining us today for episode number 32 of Hacking Exposed Live. Our topic for today is exploiting vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. All callers will be placed on mute for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to ask them using the provided question box. At the end of the session, we'll have a 15-minute Q&A period. I'll now hand you over to our host, lead author of Hacking Exposed, and silent CEO, Stuart McCord. Stuart? Thanks. Thanks uh, so much, Ryan. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I, I appreciate it. Welcome to Hacking Exposed Live. We are back on the horse uh, trying to get to really killer content around how the latest uh, and greatest attacks work and how the bad guys are leveraging them. And I think we got a doozy for you to t today. If you've been tracking what we've uh, been uh, disclosing recently, you'll see that and you'll notice that we've uh, taken a hard look at critical infrastructure and in particular uh, a couple of uh, switches from vendors that even though you know we're going to be talking about this uh, today by no means are these vulnerabilities specific to these these two particular vendors um, this is a problem that we've seen in the industry for literally decades and we're going to continue to see them uh, for the next couple of decades but we need to to highlight it we need to spotlight it because you as administrators and those that defend these networks need to 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 know exactly what the bad guys are looking after and, and how they're gaining access into these systems because you know our belief is if you can understand the way the bad guy thinks you can understand how to defend them otherwise you are uh, almost hopeless so I will say We've always had the tagline, think evil, do good, and that is very much the intention of this series with Hacking Exposed. Uh, of course, the seventh edition just came out a couple of months ago. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, lots of really cool content, especially around Embedded, uh, of which critical infrastructure and SCADA and industrial control systems, uh, hardware and software is definitely considered uh, in that genre. So, you know, as we said, we love doing this. I'm really always humbled by all the followers, uh, hundreds of followers uh, and hundreds of attendees today. Thank you so much for taking the time out. We do have a lot of content, so I'm going to get kind of right to it. Um, I am joined today by Justin Clark. Uh, Justin is a senior security researcher here at Silence. And uh, Justin uh, used to do a lot of work at PG&E and, and other places and has a penchant for discovering this kind of stuff in embedded systems. So I'm going to... Uh, just give you a quick structure overview of the webinar if you haven't already attended one of these we try and do them monthly or every so often based on opportunistic discoveries that we have uh, either vulnerabilities that are out there in the industry knowledge or intelligence that we gain throughout the year we try and bring up these webinars and try and do them as frequently as we can although sometimes you know obviously they're challenging they do take a lot of preparation because we do something very different than just about everybody and that is live demos I've been passionate about that since I first started in this game it was really the basis for the book you know create a recipe driven formulaic approach to educating all the good guys out there how the bad guys think and and I think demos and kinetic learning is the best way to do that so we're gonna do that here today we're gonna have a, a Q&A session at the end but go feel free to ask your questions throughout you know as you think of them and it'll just queue up for us we won't be able to really look and respond unless we have a little downtime um, one of us but we will definitely get to them at the end and we'll try and punch through them and answer them all and if we don't we'll, we'll obviously try and get to you and those questions afterwards we do accept inbound requests for topics so if you have ideas please uh, send them in in the Q&A session or afterwards at our email and we will from time to time of course have guest presenters both internal external partners just smart cats out there in the world that have discovered stuff we'll bring that here for you and the webinar is being recorded and available uh, in probably about two or three days depending so with that uh, let's roll exposing critical infrastructure we're gonna walk through a couple of examples of what Justin discovered recently one in RuggedCom and one in GarrettCom and uh, these are two systems that uh, of course Justin will walk you through but I wanted to make it real for everybody you know we talk about these vulnerabilities but often we never see them being exploited like this right you might see a, a variant of it but nothing exact and and so we like to kind of expose um, and, and highlight the events that occur in the industry so on September 10th you probably saw this um, Talvent disclosed that they were breached the details of which of course are uh, a little murky 
but they are a manufacturer and a management provider of uh, smart grids, smart water infrastructure, you name it. And um, the infection was, it was an infection at least from the alert that went out to customers and it was sourced and, and spread to customers uh, via the managed systems that they had. And uh, the question, all, of course, in the news was, hey, was it Chinese in nature? Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that they provided in the alert um, at surface wouldn't certainly wouldn't seem as though it's directly connected, but of course, uh, given more detailed in intelligence as as it starts to come out from them, we can probably definitively uh, select those. But those two IP addresses, for example, for C2 operations, were, were not there. One was in Canada, one was in the U.S. Um, but who knows where the backhaul is on those things? So just to make it real, this stuff really does happen. All right. So who uses this equipment? I just to make it real for everybody. Um, my top of the list was Virginia Department of Transportation, um, Delaware Department of Transportation, Danish Rail, uh, France Nuclear, City of Seattle. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, we even have kind of a architecture view of how, for example, the, um, the France Nuclear uh, Society brings this together, the Super Phoenix uh, reactor, and, and how a lot of this stuff's plugged in and connected together. Uh, City of Seattle, you name it. Even uh, this is one of my favorites too, is the Eurotap project. So how tunnel, communications throughout the tunnel uh, and tunnels around uh, Europe uh, work and, and how they, in this case Italy, uh, and how they connect to each other and, and how they communicate. So this is at the heart of what we're going to expose today. All right, so with that let me turn over presenter rights to my colleague Justin and Justin will take over and go ahead and share. Okay. Thanks, George. Take, take it away. All right. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, I wanted to start out at, not with SCADA 101, because that would be days of talking, but with just a quick um, explanation of where the equipment we're talking about exists in a control network or SCADA network. So really quickly, what we think about when we think SCADA usually is the pretty graphical screen. That's the HMI, the human machine interface that we see here on the left. Um, then when we think about stuff blowing up, that's whatever's connected to equipment out in the field, which you'll see connected to these RTUs that you'll see in the upper right at these other points. In between it, there's links. So there's layers and layers of, of things in a control network. Um, but it's probably not showing up too clear um, to everyone, but these links here in these circles um, are actually Ethernet. The, they're red lines, and I pulled this from EPA. They had a great little document here, but they're Ethernet. And it's, it's a great, <laughs> it's kind of weird to think about it this way, but it's a great demonstration of how these things are kind of forgotten because they don't even put network switches or hubs on their own diagram of a SCADA network. Um, but that's what we're here to talk about today is there are vendors that um, focus on this area. So we're going to talk about two. Um, the first one we're going to talk about is Garrettcom. And Garrettcom is a manufacturer um, of Ethernet switches and routers, amongst other devices, I believe, uh, that focus on um, critical infrastructure and hardened environments. They're made for extreme weather, extreme um, uh, humidity. Uh, in fact, the picture here is actually, we pulled it from the web, it's an Italian uh, liquefied natural gas company um, that has standardized part or all their infrastructure on um, Garrettcom. So this stuff is out there everywhere. Um, it meets and exceeds industry standards for that you'd expect to see in the field um, when you're talking about making equipment reliable on a, on a freighter or in a substation or in a traffic cabinet that you'll see walking down the street. So that's what we have. Um, and I bought one off eBay because that's what I do. Um, and so I got one and here's what happened is um, I've wanted to find another disclosure. Um, it was coming off the heels of another one, a rugged com one. So April 30th um, at home I unboxed a new device from an auction site um, and within 15 minutes I had um, a vulnerability. And it doesn't mean that this was um, that this was some huge oversight. This happens to every vendor, like Stuart said. Um, it's just something that had not been looked at. I, it was an unintentional 
mistake on many people's parts. Um, so like I said, discovered April 30th. Um, the next day, because that was a weekend, uh, Monday I, I sent it to uh, ICS CERT. DHS handled the entire vulnerability process uh, with uh, Garrettcom, who um, handled it extremely well. They actually had a firmware patch out on May 18th, um, so insanely fast timeline. I think we actually got it because um, they had firmware coming out already. So they fixed this error in the firmware and uh, they gave the utilities, the end users, 90-ish um, days uh, to patch while it was for official use only and it finally became public on August 30th. So, you know, I'm using this Garrettcom one first because uh, the, the few steps that we use to get this vulnerability um, or to find it and, and exploit it are uh, the first steps of, of RuggedCom. So we're going to talk about RuggedCom next, but um, this is how we did it. I'll go through it on some slides, then I'll do it live for you now. Yeah, and Justin, while you're kind of uh, switching over real quick, I just want to make sure everybody understands. I mean, this first, this first discovery is pretty, you know, I, I won't say kindergarten because I don't want to demean it, but I mean, it. the technique is, is so simple and basic, right? It, it, it goes back literally 20 years of just finding vulns, but we still have the problem today, and I want to keep reemphasizing that, that, you know, as of latest versions of, of binaries and firmwares and RTOSs and, and you know, bootable ROMs and things of that nature, this stuff is built in by default by design. Um, in many cases, so you know, don't forget about this stuff because it's present everywhere. And the techniques that Justin's going to show you, of course, um, every one of these you should be able to do on your own, of course, authorized uh, systems and and uh, equipment uh, on not just what we're highlighting today, but a lot of other systems that you probably have out there, and a lot of other different hardware vendors. These same techniques can be used to look for those kinds of flaws and uh, you know if you find any of course please uh, notify ICS cert uh, let us know if uh, you find something juicy <laughs> all yeah. right so go ahead just <laughs> thanks yeah and you're right this is very simplistic but you know it's not all Garrettcom's fault uh, this has been in the field so it's for anyone to discover but here's how we did it um, first off you can download the firmware um, I never actually extracted the firmware from the switch. Um, I actually, it, this is a screenshot from their website a few days ago. I'll show you how to get there, but you can download it. Um, the next thing we do is we're going to use a tool. This is a screenshot. Um, I'll go through it and explain the commands as I do it, but uh, basically we need to grab the firmware. We run it through a cool tool called DZ. That's D-E-E-Z-E-E. -E -E -E. And all it does is um, another security research company uh, made this open source several years ago and it goes through a file, finds uh, ZLib um, encoded or compressed sections, and then pulls them out into separate files. So it saves you from extra commands. I like the tool. There might be something better, but I just don't know about it yet. So um, anyways, we get those files. We find uh, that we'll have uh, a decompressed file out of that original two megabyte file. We get 4.2 megabytes of compressed uh, data. And then we need to do strings on it. I like strings. Um, it saves me from having to open a disassembler and actually think. And uh, what I did is, uh, this was that, that quick. Um, you think about what a, what a service account would be, what a vendor would put in there for debugging or, or factory purposes. And the first thing I looked for was factory, and sure enough, there it is. Um, immediately after that is a password, um, or what looks like a human-made random set of, of eight characters. And uh, sure enough, that was the password. Um, so I'm going to show that to you right now. Um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more um, as I do it. So what we're going to do is fire up a web browser. We're going to go to Garrettcom's website. And uh, again, this is not an issue. Some people may be thinking, if I can download firmware from there, it must be bad. Well, you know. If I couldn't download the firmware from here, I would just pull it out of Switch. So, um, right, yeah, it's it's important to note that you know, like I said before, we're not picking on anybody. It's just the reality of the world today that the stuff's designed insecurely, and hard coded passwords are definitely a part of the problem. I think passwords are scourge of the earth, quite frankly. And uh, you know, I'm uh, every time I got to use another password, get sick to my stomach. To be honest with you, so. This is part of the problem is uh, we just don't have a lot of sophisticated designers around this stuff and uh, it, it really harkens back 10, 15 years to the, the software world and operating system world of how insecure it was. 
So exactly. So um, what I've done is I copied the uh, the link for uh, the firmware update. I've downloaded it to a temporary directory on my computer. Um, I have DZ compiled for Windows. Um, it took some work of a colleague of mine. Thankfully, he did it in no time. Um, so what I'm going to do is DZ that file. Now we see that we have three files. It always ends up with a zero length uh, file, but we see this 4.2 megabyte file, rel something dot bin dot zero. Again, this is all I did. I'm going to run it through strings, type it through less, search for factory, and I'm <laughs> I'm not fast forwarding. This is what I did at home on my couch when I wanted this on a Saturday or Sunday. And there it is. So the fun story behind this is I actually bought this switch, um, and I'm going to log into a switch right now with this. I bought this switch from a, the used market, and I didn't have a serial cable to get into it, so I, uh, even if there is a password recovery method, I didn't have a serial cable at home to do this with. So I telneted to it. No SSH on mine. And the default passwords, which I don't need to go through right now, default admin password um, didn't work. But what did work was the operator password. And the operator password doesn't let me change the configuration. I couldn't set an IP address. I couldn't do other stuff. It's just kind of halfway between admin and guest. Um, so the factory account didn't work remotely. But what did happen is I figured out by doing strings more or doing help, um, there's an enable command, uh, which isn't like Cisco enable, but think of it like SU on Unix. Uh, so I can escalate my privileges or try to re-log in as another user. So what I can do now, type in enable factory, type in the password that I found in the firmware that I think is a password, and I'm now full factory level access into the switch. So I could change the IP address finally now. So that was it. Um, start to end at home, about 15 minutes, um, and I think we just demonstrated it in less than five minutes. Um, so uh, it worked out. Uh, Garrett patched this. Uh, they were great to work with. Um, I know it's, it's, it has to be hard for a vendor dealing with stuff like this for the first time, um, but it's kind of like riding a motorcycle. <laughs> like they say, there's those who have fallen, and there's those who are going to fall. It's it's basically that with with equipment. If you if you haven't had any security vulnerabilities disclosed, you know, it's probably because no one's looking. So this was the first time someone looked um, from the outside. Anyways, that was the Garrettcom vulnerability there. So I did Garrettcom first because the ruggedcom thing that we're going to talk about now um, builds off that. So I can skip those steps. Um, same thing as I said about Garrettcom. Uh, Ruggedcom is the same thing. I'm sure each of them would tell you their products are different and better, but um, pretty much they're used for harsh, hardened environments. Um, so they meet and exceed standards that companies like Cisco and, and Linksys, or well, same company, uh, companies like Cisco don't meet, or maybe they do now. Uh, and that's a picture of the switch that we're going to be uh, talking to today. The one on the right is the, uh, the Ruggedcom switch. Uh, so. The story behind this one is I was joining Silence and Stuart said to me, well, give me something for my talk. I said, I remember a talk we were doing in LA and I said, well, okay, how about a SSL key in, in Ruggedcom, hard-coded? He's like, that's great. Then I went back and I looked and I realized that I was thinking of a different vendor's product where I saw a hard-coded SSL key. So instead of taking, again, five, ten minutes to get a finding, uh, that would be great to talk about at a conference. I got to spend a week uh, tearing my hair out uh, to figure out this process. So um, this is basically, go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry, Justin, I, I, I know I, I want you to get going on this, but this is huge, guys. This next technique and next process you probably have never seen before. Um, I cer we certainly have not found it out, out there in the public. And uh, it really is enlightening. Uh, to how, how much we can go after now uh, finding these private keys uh, inside embedded in firmware. 
Um, and uh, Justin's going to demonstrate how that's done, and then of course show how the exploitation works and, and what it really exposes. Okay, go, Justin. You got it. And yes, um, please email me after the fact if this is not a novel method. If this has been done before, please, I'd I'd love to hear about it so I can stop saying that we discovered this. So in this case, for RuggedCom, um, you can't download the firmware as a just a person on the internet. So luckily, uh, I'll walk you through it. Um, we can actually pull the firmware directly off the switch using a TFTP command. Um, same thing as before, uh, we're going to use DZ to uh, unpack it. It's the tool that just keeps on giving here. Um, we're going to find a, a compressed, two compressed sections, one of which we actually care about. Um, we're going to find some data about what encryption library they find um, because they didn't build their own. Um, they bought one off the shelf, which everyone does, and the one they chose was Makana. I found Makana's documentation on the internet in multiple places um, because I'm not a licensed user of it. Um, and I found out how they store uh, actual encryption material in, um, in their programs. So this is a screenshot of the manual. Um, I use that understanding to find within the compressed uh, firmware the actual uh, blob of, of private key data. We use a uh, awesome website that I'll use on this uh, on this webinar to actually generate the remaining values because while there's five or six RSA key values you need for a valid key, uh, they only give us four of them. Um, so we'll go through that and then we create an actual PEM key which is what a lot of us are, are familiar with if, if you've ever bought a SSL key from like GoDaddy or something. This is the, the private key um, and we're actually creating this. I'll create this for you. And then we're going to go into Wireshark, load these keys, and decrypt actual traffic from my switch. And you'll see my super secret admin password. All right. Let me close down a couple things here. So what I'm going to do here first is load up the SolarWinds TFTP server, my favorite free TFTP server for Windows. Just for proof here, whoops, I did have one. My TFTP root is empty. I'll leave this window open as well so you can see this binary come through. And in this case, uh, again, it's a switch acquired off of a uh, auction site. And uh, here we go. Again, Telnet. Not cool enough for SSH. So we're going to log in as admin, uh, and again, this is for getting the firmware. So yes, I know the admin password. No big deal here. Um, I'm going to drop to a shell with the control S. It says it at the bottom of our screen here. Uh, let me make the screen bigger. And without going through all the hassle here. There is a command, you can actually see whatever file system they use. You can see files in there. There's a bunch of interesting things. Um, the one file we're going to get is called main.bin. Description is operating system firmware. Um, for those of you out there, if, if anyone wants this, um, I mean, you can buy your own switches off eBay or somewhere, or contact me and we can see if we can work something out to get access to my own switches. But there's FPGA config files. Um, there's other flash data that I, I don't know what it is. or haven't actually looked yet. Yeah. So what we're going to do is now is get TFTP help. Uh, so we're going to do a TFTP. Okay. All right. And we see on the right-hand side, may not have been is showing up. We see that it is actually transferring now. No smoke and mirrors. We will wait. OK, it is done. All right, so I'm out of the switch now. And we will go to, we see we have a about a 1.1 megabyte file. And I will make a folder. Just move it to my actual directory. There we go, same file. Going to again use the tool that uh, our colleague Derek made, which is awesome. We see two compressed sections came out of it, and at this point, um, again, this took a week, so I'm, I'm 
compressing this down into less than 30 minutes. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of pulling my hair out here, but eventually we can figure out that. Eh, main.bin.0 has a mention of SSL in all caps in it. So that's how I know this file is the one I want. We're going to focus on main.bin.0. I'm also going to open up my SIGWIN home directory. These are the files we're looking at. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do Do some strings, see what's going on. No disassembler. They're expensive or confusing. But we see a bunch of stuff. Um, we see some interesting things here um, that we're going to come back to. But a couple things I want to show you are these. I'll clear my screen. So going through this binary, uh, it took a while to figure it out, but Eventually, I saw their SSH host string here, or version string, which is Mokana SSH. So that is how I found out that they use the Mokana libraries. All right, that's done. The next thing we're going to do is just to make sure to paint the picture for how I know I'm on the right track. Is I'm going to fire up the web interface for my own switch here. It'll take a second in the background. And it warns because it is a not a valid certificate or a self-signed certificate. Um, what I'm going to do is make a little note. You can see just by going into any switch, um, going to mine here, uh, serial number, uh, which is in alpha three nine or five. Uh, we can see the issuer, um, and I'm just looking at these to get kind of data that I'm going to be looking for later on in the talk. I'll reference these. So I'm going to say A395 later on, which is the serial number of this certificate on my live switch. I'm going to say the words Engineering Concord, Ontario, Canada. So I know that's kind of what I'm looking for. I'll know if I'm on the right path. So and just to be clear, that that's the public cert. That is at correct. This, at this at this stage, right. Okay. That is correct. I'd hate to I'd hate to dig into a file and realize this is not the one I need to be looking at. Um, but here we go. We said Ontario earlier, and we actually see the data that we saw in that um, in that certificate a second ago is here. So Concord, Ontario. Cool. Okay. I think I'm on the right path. So what I want to do is see if that is really an SSL key. And what I'm going to do is open up this binary. I'm going to open it up in HXD, which is a free hex editor for Windows. Hasn't been updated in a couple of years, I think, but it's pretty good. And of course it doesn't file Ontario. I think it's lowercase, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Do case and sentence. So. Whoops. Oh, that's what you get for doing it live with me. <laughs> oh, the wrong file. You know it's live. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> proof. Okay, so here we see the strings Ontario. Um, so this is the section we're looking at. And really quickly, all I'm going to do is pull out this thing. Uh, there should be an automated way to do this. It's a scripting job um, for later on uh, to, to look for ASN1 uh, objects within a binary or a file. But right here, um, the way I like to do these things is look for giant lengths of zeros or Fs in a hex. And so I see all those, and then I see 3082, that, and then a little bit later, uh, the words we're talking about. If I keep going down, uh, and this took trial and error, but I now know the answer, so I'm just going to get to that for you. Um, if I keep looking down, we see more, uh, a section right after what I've selected, which is four uh, bytes of zero. So I'm going to copy this, control C, make a new file, paste it, I'm going to save this, the same directory we're working on, and I'm going to name it pub. So here we see, 
file pub that I just made. And what we're going to do is use the OpenSSL command line to see if this actually is a certificate and tell us what data is in there. Bigger, please work. There you go, no errors. So if you copy too much text, which is what happened to me a bunch of times until I figured out where to cut it, um, it'll actually do this, but then error out at the end and say invalid object or something. But the point is, we see all those words we saw earlier, but like I said, we come back to uh, alpha 3, 9, or 5. The serial number for this public key that I found in the firmware matches the serial number for the public key that was uh, that my browser was given when I uh, logged when I opened it up in my web browser. So at this point, I knew I was on the right path. Um, I could safely stay up for more hours in the early, early morning uh, dealing with this. So the next thing that we're going to do, I'll pause here while I make sure i got all my notes in front of me. Next thing we're going to do is figure out, OK, I know I'm going to use Makana SSL then use Macon SSL. I know I don't have access to any of the software. I don't have anyone to tell me how to use this. So what do I do? So I went to Google and I typed in Mokana uh, key blob uh, PDF. And sure enough, there's including the, uh, they all have this, uh, I'd click on the one on their own site, but the one I always use is the first one. I don't want to risk not showing it. But we're going to go through, let's do a quick search. And here's a section, how are key blobs formatted? Um, come on. So scrolling down a page, it explains a bunch of stuff. But I see, for our sake keys, which is what we're dealing with, um, it looks like, and what I'm going to focus on is this, the ENPQ. Um, I'm looking for a section of, of data that has four bytes that defines a length of a string, and then whatever that length was in data. Then I'm going to look for another four bytes of a length string, then that data, and so on four times in a row. And so that didn't make sense to you right now. It didn't make sense to me reading this until I actually got to the end. Uh, this. It was horrible reading this, um, but I figured it out, and, and hopefully demonstrating it will kind of paint the picture for you. But we're looking for four bytes of length of something, and then that actual length of data. Back to my binary. Close pub. Just prove no smoke and mirrors. We're still going to open up main.bin.0. So we're back here. Um, so again, a week of time. Don't want to say that too much, but it was a week. So here's how I finally got to it. I looked for the word SSL twice. And uh, there's only two mentions of SSL in this in this firmware image. Um, and so what I did, oops, getting back to it. There's more than two. So this one, I see SSL and a bunch of readable stuff. I see a bunch of data beforehand, and so then I see above it, I'm selecting a bunch of data. Um, above it, it looks like MIME types from a web server. So I know I'm talking, I'm seeing web server stuff because I see MIME types above it, or, or whatever. I see SSL stuff below it, so there's a bunch of data here. So again, it's a great opportunity for a uh, quick and dirty Python or Perl script, but I did this manually. Uh, what we found here is four bytes that's, uh, that is basically 0 by 41, hexadecimal, so 41 length and hex. Uh, now a quick note, look at the bottom of the HXD screen here on my screen, you'll see right now it says length of four, that means I have four bytes, and so that length is in, is in hex, not decimal. So what I'm going to do is I know I'm looking for 41 bytes of data, so select until this says 41. I think I'm onto something because all of a sudden I see another, right after that, 41. So, okay, select that again. 41 length again. 
Let's see, 80. Okay, let's get down to 80. Wow, I saw a three. I select three. And then I'm into human readable stuff. I've got four sections of, of data that matches the format uh, that Makana defined. Uh, so I think I'm onto something. I think I've, I've got it. Well, I know I've got it now. So what we're going to do is go to another one of my favorite websites. It's not an evil website. It's just using math, but it does it in JavaScript. So uh, what they do, almost anyone can do. I'm going to close my browser. Open the browser. So mobilefish.com, cool little site, online RSA key generation. Uh, I, I like it because it actually, well, it does what I needed, and it, it helps explain what, what happens behind the scenes. So what I'm going to do really quickly is it took a little bit of trial and error. I'm going to select the data here. The first key we found was actually P, and that's an RSA value. The second value we found was Q, which is the second prime in a uh, RSA key. And I had those other two values, and I need more than that still, but all I need is those two primes, and I'm, I'm home free. So what we're going to do now is scroll down. I've pasted those two values. Uh, the public exponent's already the public exponent we, uh, we saw in that, in that uh, binary. Hit generate keys. And magical JavaScript has generated for me uh, n, uh, as well as the other exponents that we'll need in a second. I'm just going to go really quickly and make a note. Um, I didn't realize it did this when I did this at first, um, but you'll notice the modulus that calculated uh, starts in 405 delta, ends in 5305. Back here, that 80 byte section, 405 delta, and where's the 80? And it ends in five three zero five there. So I know this this calculates this works. The tool's not giving me bad data. All right. So I've got all these values. I've got a bunch of. I've got basically a giant math problem that would give me a headache. Um, so what do I do with all this data? Well, now I've got to get it into a key. Uh, I use Wireshark because it's cool and has a GUI. Um, but Wireshark needs a, a PEM formatted key. What I'm going to do, and we are really on the home stretch here. Clear my screen. Proof there's nothing in my uh, directory here. And what I'm going to do is generate just a, a random key. Ten twenty four bit. Good. And now I've got a file called key.pem. Cool. Uh, I could also pull out because I'm going to need it in just a second. Clear screen open. So. So I'm going to need all these, these values in just a second. But what I did is open SSL's RSA command, which shows me ran, the random values that exist in this key, um, or calc, random and calculated values. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize um, that. I don't actually need my hex editor anymore. And I'm going to open up another freeware tool I found on the internet that hasn't been updated in years called ASN.1Editor. Uh, I'm going to open up that key.pem. And so what I see here is a bunch of values. And uh, all I'm going to do is replace these values with the values that we have in my minimized uh, web browser. Yeah, and this is, uh, <clears throat> this is obviously just a generic little you know, PEM file that's been created using OpenSSL, and now we're going to take the actual values of what we've captured and calculated and, and put it in to this particular key file and basically turn this generic key file into a specific private key file. <coughs> that's correct. So the data I see here, um, and all I did was do a cross-correlation here. So I know that 00, 00 echo 3 is the modulus. I've copied the modulus from the other window, pasted it in. Uh, that's E. I've got my cheat sheet so we don't have to go through this. Oh, okay. The next one is the private exponent. Just a few. 
few more values to edit here. This would be prime one. Copy prime one. Prime two is the next one. Last one is the coefficient, which is QINV. Okay, cool. And we save it. All right. And as we say, we're we're you know, we're either the dumbest or the bravest to do this live. But uh, <laughs> Justin, why don't you give it a shot? Yeah. And I just uh, I just redid the OpenSSL command. We can see all the values here. What I'm going to do is I have a Wireshark. Um, I have Wireshark here. Um, this is a session between uh, my computer and um, the Rogatcom switch uh, that sits behind me that I got for 40 bucks. Uh, and you've recorded it, but you've recorded uh, encrypted streams in there that you can't see right now. That's right. And uh, what I'm going to do is, that's actually a great point, Stuart. Um, really quickly, so to do SSL, um, I'm going to clear this out just in case it is there. Yeah. So I'm going to go back for everyone. Um, but I know the packet that I'm looking for is number 246. Uh, that's, the, that's the goal of us here, seeing this data. So right now, I am going to come back to it's not lying. Yeah, so it is going to be number 246. Uh, the, one, the things I want to make uh, note of here are that there is nothing at the bottom uh, of the screen because uh, that's where I'm going to go to see the decrypt data. It is just a bunch of gibberish between uh, my computer and that switch with 10.0.1.1.8.7. So if you're going to use Wireshark, um, like me, uh, the way we do this is go to Preferences once we're in Wireshark. Uh, we're going to go to protocols, scroll down to the preferences for the SSL dissector, and it looks different in different versions. So the manuals you'll find online, actually, they look different. This is current Wireshark. Um, so what we do is we hit edit for the RSA keys. We're going to do a new. We're going to tell it I'm decoding for 10.0.1.187 for port 443. The protocol is HTTP. Um, because that's the underlying encrypted protocol, and case does matter. <laughs> uh, so please, lowercase, um, keep that in mind. Um, the last thing we're going to do is... Key.pem, which we just created, modified at 1444, it's 1446 now. Hit OK. Uh, I don't know if this is actually required. It could have just been me, but I'm going to just for making sure I had to do the reverse reverse direction one time as well. Okay, done, done, okay. Wow. I don't know if everyone saw that, but uh, right now my entire screen just changed. Uh, all of a sudden we got lines where they were all gray because it actually decoded SSL. Hit okay. Uh, the things I was pointing out earlier to make you realize that I wasn't uh, making this up, is at the bottom here we see decrypted SSL data. I am on packet number 246. And if I click on this one here, decrypted SSL data, this is me logging into the switch. Uh, amongst other data, you'll see, I keep selecting that. You'll see at the very end, user equals admin, password equals admin, because I never changed my default password. So. That's it. Any uh, Using that key, it's not just my own switch, it's any switch uh, that uses firmware from Ruggedcom that has the certificate in it, which is dated 2005. Um, they have released a patch, uh, or I think they're about to release a patch, I'm sorry. Um, I, I don't know when that's actually going to happen. It may have already happened. All right. Uh, thanks, Justin. It's awesome. Thank you. 
All right, so let me take uh, control here. And we will jump over to countermeasures. And feel free to jump in here, obviously, uh, Justin, if you have any kind of anecdotals uh, around how to prevent this stuff, how to attack, prevent an attack on this particular vector. But obviously, filter all your SSL traffic, right? Uh, to and from internet facing systems. I mean, these switches should not be connected to anything on the internet, and they should also be restricted to who can connect to them from the inside or on uh, the controlled networks uh, internally. And, uh, you know, restrict it as much as you can from controlled sources. You could even do it by MAC address, uh, by various different techniques, uh, filtered just by IP address, you name it. Um, you know, where available, obviously patch as, as quickly as you can. Um, and, uh, you know, as Justin uh, likes to mention, you know, try and pick hardware, make, make security features a requirement inside their hard, the hardware. And one of the features that would obviously prevent this type of attack is f that allows you to basically generate a private key um, at initial power on. So it's a random device specific key that's ge not generically used in all firmware. I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about there, Justin. But uh, if you if you got some insight, please uh, feel free to jump in. But at any rate, Oops, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you you have experience and and thoughts on that one, but that's a great one. Obviously, you know a lot of uh, wireless access points allow that, allow you to do that. You know why can't we do that in industrial control systems infrastructure? Right. And the answer is we should. Uh, you know whether it's industrial control systems or anywhere else. Um, I mean. This this problem has been solved. People could talk about doing further obfuscation or other countermeasures, but the the problem has been solved uh, years ago by people like Cisco, where um, you enable encryption in various uh, parts of the of the um, routers or switches they sell, and a key is generated automatically. Um, right. The processors are fast enough to do this, like you saw on my own computer, it did it in microseconds. So. Um, and of, and and of course, you know, as we always recommend, use the hacking exposed style. I mean, use these techniques to find in your own hardware and software these flaws. Uh, you know, report them to vendors, uh, to your support organizations, uh, report them to us if you want. But basically, get patches, get fixes, and require and demand of vendors that they take the security more seriously. I think. So, with that said. Um, Great job, Justin. I will say that we've got some further resources that you can take a look at. Of course, uh, a Hacking Exposed Twitter feed, which we've been doing live Twitter feeds from. Also, uh, the, the official uh, Hacking Exposed live website is up, and uh, we've got a lot of content there, uh, prior videos. Uh, we'll have new webinars posted up there as well. We've got, of course, uh, YouTube channel and uh, we've got if you have any questions or if you have suggestions for new topics please send an email into info at hackingexposed.com and of course uh, Silence's LinkedIn page we will continually update that with new findings with a lot of this stuff. All right so we're at the Q&A uh, point if you have any questions hopefully you've been kind of teeing them up um, we're going to take a look at those questions as we go through it now I'm going to have Justin take a peek at it I'm going to probably uh, find a few nuggets and I'll I'll mention them out loud and then Justin and I can try to answer them. If we don't get to your question, we'll try and do it after the webinar. So uh, please don't hate us if we if we don't find it um, right now in the moment. Okay. So while you are ans or asking those questions, uh, I know a lot of you have been asking me and a lot of us. You know, who is Silence? What do we do? Uh, who are we? Well, we are a stealth uh, security startup company, and uh, of course, if you've tracked my background at all, um, you know that I just recently left McAfee, where I was global CTO of uh, McAfee Worldwide, and I really got to the point where I, I want to make a huge difference day-to-day uh, -day and get back in this fight, and to me, the best way to do that, the way I know how to do it the best, is uh, at, in a startup in a small, nimble a company and so this works uh, beautiful for us and we're we're offering product services and, and research um, we're being vague on purpose at this point but you know please stay tuned and, and keep up to date with us because we'll be uh, exposing more and more as, as time comes up and we are hiring extensively so if you know any smart people you're a smart person presume you are because you come here please send uh, 
your CV or resume in and I would love to talk to you. Okay, so with that said, let me pull open some of the questions and see what we got here. Okay, we got some good one. Um, okay, do you have a good download location for Black Bag DZ as it appears? Uh, Matasano has scrubbed this tool from their website. Well, we actually, yeah, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, um, the place I found it is actually macports.org has, um, if, you, if you just Google macports um, black bag, um, one of their mirrors um, still has the, the tarball, and it compiles easily on current-gen Linux. And uh, let's see, we got, yeah, we, we compiled it. Uh, one of our guys, Derek, compiled it for Windows, so it works like a champ in Windows as well. Rock solid. Uh, let's see. Uh, great presentation. Uh, F5, uh, Big IP had problems with this in June of this year. Private key was snatched. Yes, that's true. Uh, they had it in, in the F5. Um, and uh, the technique, though, I don't think was ever disclosed, was it? Do you know the technique on the F5 uh, private key pull? I don't know. I wish I was the one that found it, though. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know how that was disclosed. If it was disclosed in the same manner as this, then then yes, that's great. I mean, then it's the same technique. I, I actually um, have not looked into the details of that. I don't have it. If you do have more details, please send it in to us on that one. But yeah, you're right. In fact, I think they won the uh, the, po the Pony Award. They did. Yeah. Yeah. At Black Hat or DEF CON. So that's great. Um, is the walkthrough for how the SSL cert was found in the binary? Oh, he's going to be published. Um, you know, did we publish that for the B-Sides talk? Did I uh, think that go public? I don't recall. Uh, let me look into that. You know, we I'm pretty sure we did that publicly at RSA China. I'm also in RSA London next week, and I'm going to be talking about it and making it public there as well. So yeah. feel free to, um, uh, you know, just ask me for the PDF deck. I'm uh, happy to share it with you. And we All also right. have we also have a ten page write up on it that I think we need to we can pare down a little bit to go into more depth than not insane depth. That's true. If you guys really want to see a white paper on it step by step, I, I think we can pull something together. Justin can whip it together, and we can make it available. Okay. Any uh, any other questions or thoughts uh, from you, Justin? You know, I got one actually. Um, I just checked my personal IMs, and I got I got something sent to me, which is uh, someone's asking um, if they hypothetically found a bug in a product that they that they purchased, whether it's for their employer or, or otherwise, um, what should they do? Okay. Um, and yep. so, uh, you know, my recommendation is if it's critical, um, if it's if it's industrial control system, ICS search there, they're your friends. Yes, they are DHS or one of the DOE labs, but um, they're really nice people and uh, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it weren't for them uh, because they really are a, a great asset. And if it's not critical infrastructure stuff, um, US CERT, which is uh, well, kind of the same thing. They're going to get mad at me for saying that, but pretty much the same thing, but just for non-industrial control systems. I mean, they'll talk to anyone. You don't have to be special. Just call them and say, I think I have a problem. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, ICS CERT has really stepped up um, and uh, pr provided kind of a middleman role between discoverer and vendor where we don't have to deal with the uh, traditional bullying you know that usually occurs <laughs> at least right. as it used to occur uh, and that's been just a phenomenal resource for everybody in the industry so please don't don't be afraid to, to reach out to them and, and let them know about any discovery that you may have uh, that's the first place we would go to if you if you shared it with us right we would yep. go to them uh, responsible disclosure so uh, let's see, one last question. All unpatched rugged comm equipment uses the same cert, right? Uh, question is yes, right? I mean, at least with that firmware. Uh, that, yeah. That's by firmware, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the full history of the product line, but this certificate was generated in 2005. Um, yeah. Rugged comm does have, uh, through acquisition, uh, a third product line. They have two, uh, they have the rugged router, rugged switch, and they bought a WiMAX line. So, okay. These SSL keys are for the devices that run rugged operating system ROS, so not rugged router, not WiMAX. But um, actually, yeah, sorry to do this at the very end. Siemens, I gotta say, um, I mean, they got a lot of flack in the past uh, from um, previous researchers and from me as well. But you know what? We did this, and Siemens kind of was silent for a while, so I was a little bit worried. But they came back and self-disclosed a pile of other 
vulnerabilities um, in their WiMAX and rugged router uh, lines, as well as the ROS line. They disclosed um, SSH keys that were in the firmware that I would have found if I looked more. Um, they disclosed SSL keys in these other devices as well, so um, it's great. Okay, yeah, great. And then last, we have a lot, one last question, then we'll end it. Uh, is in Garacom's case, you need to first have the operator password, which is not generally known, right? And and as I understand it, no, you didn't. I mean, you just pulled it straight from the binary. It was like old school. You just grab the firmware, look for the factory name, username, and, if, and the password was right below it, so you didn't need any operator. Yeah. And, the, and the firmware was available on the website on Garacom, so you don't need it. Right. Is that correct? If the, quest, yeah. if the question is, um, if the question is, what do I need to be able to find that password? Uh, the answer is you just need a copy of the binary. You don't need access to any switch. If the question right. is, though, well, uh, is this a remote backdoor or is this a privilege escalation? By the book definition, this is a privilege escalation. You do need to be authenticated at some level to the switch prior to using that factory password to do anything. Um, yeah, that's so a good clarification. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, once again, thank you so much, uh, Justin, for showing this and exposing the technique. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. Keep an eye out for the next edition of Hacking Expose Live. Thanks, everyone. Have a thank great Thank you. One. All right, bye.